Okay, hi everyone. I'm Hani Nazami and I'm going to be teaching the Introduction to Carbohydrates lecture. Mm -hmm. um, just so you guys know, the way that I usually teach this is like interactive. So I'll teach it and then in the next slide, I'm going to quiz you on everything um, that I've just taught you. Um, so usually the first part is like a drawing and then I'll quiz you in the next slide on uh, using text or something like that. And they're the same slides as the one that you guys have been taught, I've just added a few extra things to help me. Um, and then the second thing is that if you have any questions, I would prefer if you text them on the group chat, like on the meeting chat, because I have it open right now. And I wanna be able that I can get everyone's concerns out of the way. Like, I don't wanna wait till the end. Although of course there will be time at the end, but you can ask throughout and I'll answer it throughout as well. Okay, so we can start. Here's a learning objective. Okay, so there is going to be a segment of this that gets pretty hard, but I've tried my best to um, make it as easy as possible. So let's just get some easy things out of the way, just because I want you guys to be comfortable with how I teach. So um, obviously we're talking about carbohydrates today. Um, and the way that carbohydrates are formed is that they're formed from H2O and CO2. And so that's why they're really good for the environment. They take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, which is good in terms of like pollution and that kind of stuff. What is that process called? What do I call it when plants use CO2 and H2O to make a carbohydrate? Yeah, photosynthesis. exactly, photosynthesis. I know it's really easy, but I just want you guys to get comfortable with how I teach. Um, and then the rest of this we'll cover um, later on. Okay, so again, this is easy. We're starting off with simple things. But let's just get into like why we're talking about carbohydrates in general, like why are they relevant? One of the main things is that they're important for cell to cell communication. And the main idea that I think what the doctor wanted you to understand from this slide is that I can have pathogens, so stuff like viruses and bacteria, and the way that they recognize my cell is actually from this structure over here. Hang on, let me do a laser pointer. from this structure over here, which is an oligosaccharide. Oligo means few, saccharide means sugar. So pretty much this is my cell over here and sticking out of my cell, you can see I have this short segment over here and it's called an oligosaccharide. And this oligosaccharide is how certain things like bacteria or viruses can actually recognize the cell. So that's why we're learning about them because they're important for that. On the flip side, our human body cells can actually also recognize other things, for example, lymphocytes or neutrophils, which are white blood cells. Um, so our body can also recognize other oligosaccharides. So that's what it's important for cell to cell communication or like recognition pretty much. There's one other one, I think you guys have covered this before, but there's um, a molecule called the mannose 6-phosphate receptor and it's located in your Golgi apparatus. And pretty much it can detect oligosaccharides, specifically like mannose oligosaccharides, and it tags them. And after it tags the enzyme, the enzyme is going to be sent to the lysosome. So pretty much the key idea over here is that oligosaccharides, like I said, are important for recognition. And a specific one that's used inside of our cells is called mannose 6-phosphate receptor. And that is able to tag certain enzymes or certain proteins and after this mannose 6-phosphate receptor tags them, um, they are sent to the lysosome or they form lysosomes. Okay, somebody's asking me to repeat. Um, so this part, so I have the structure over here, right? So imagine this is my Golgi apparatus. This entire thing over here is my Golgi apparatus. I have this little molecule over here, right? And it's embedded into my Golgi apparatus and it's called the mannose 6-phosphate receptor. The point of this is that I have my Golgi apparatus and sometimes these vesicles are not meant to leave the cell. Sometimes these vesicles that form from my Golgi apparatus are meant to actually stay inside of my cell. But my body needs some sort of signal to detect that. And so what happens is that the mannose 6-phosphate receptor that's sitting in my Golgi apparatus is going to sense a specific oligosaccharide that you can see over here. And once it senses the specific oligosaccharide, it's going to make sure that this vesicle does not leave. It makes sure that this vesicle instead forms a lysosome. 
So the monosyxphosphate receptor is important to make sure that certain vesicles stay inside the cell or form lysosomes. Does that make sense? Yes, no. The point of phosphate receptor. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is pretty much just a repetition of the slide before. Um, like I told you before, we can have different viruses, we can have different bacteria that use oligosaccharides, which pretty much stick out of our cell for recognition. Again, oligo means few, saccharides means sugar. So I have these little sugars that stick out of my cells and they're used for cell recognition. They just give you a couple examples. Um, so again, just so you guys get familiar with the format, what was the name of the receptor that I talked about in the previous slide that was important for targeting enzyme to transfer them to lysosomes? What was the name of that receptor? Yeah, manosyxphosphate. Exactly. Okay, so um, now that we're talking about um, carbohydrates, just so that you guys are familiar with terminology, we have monosaccharides, which is just one sugar. Mono means one. I can have polysaccharides, which we're gonna go into the precise definition later, but this means a lot of sugar. So these are very big sugars. Um, and then one thing I want you guys to be familiar with is I want you to look at these functional groups. You don't need to memorize them, but I just want you guys to be familiar with them so that you understand what's going to be happening later when things get a little bit um, more confusing. So a carbonyl group is when I have a C double bonded to an O, and you can see that over here, if depending on what the C is attached to, it can either become an aldehyde or it can become a ketone. So for example, if the C is bonded to a hydrogen, and R just means literally anything, R can be anything then it's going to form an aldehyde, or I call that functional group an aldehyde. But if I have a C that's attached to a group and then another group, so one of these is not hydrogen, then that's gonna be a ketone. So the main idea I want you to convey is that these aldehydes and ketones are so similar, right? They look so similar. The only difference is that an aldehyde has an H, whereas a ketone has an R. And again, R can be anything. R can be nitrogen, R can be an entire group, it can be whatever but there's just one difference between aldehyde and ketone. It's an H versus an R group. Um, and that's important because you're gonna see that we can actually convert aldehydes to ketones and ketones to aldehydes. Okay, so um, over here, you can see what I'm talking about. So I told you the C double bonded O is what I called a carbonyl group. So this thing over here in pink, and that you'll notice that if I have a C double bond to an O, and then that C is also attached to an H, I'm going to call this an aldehyde. But if my C is double bonded to an O, and then the other two groups are an R, this entire thing is an R, so anything that's not an H, and then this entire thing is an R, because it's not an H, I'm going to call this a ketone. So I'm just trying to show you visually what the difference between an aldehyde and a ketone is. Um, I'm sure you guys know this, but a ribose is five carbon sugar. Right, ribose, we can see, you guys have probably heard of RNA, um, DNA. So RNA actually stands for ribonucleic acid. And the reason it's called that is because RNA has ribose as its sugar. A six carbon sugar, something like glucose. And I want you guys to know this one because I'm going to quiz you a lot on it throughout this lecture. So fructose is actually the ketose form of glucose. So remember what I was talking about, how you can have an aldehyde and all I need to change is this H if I change this H into anything else, it becomes a ketose. Well, specifically, if I have glucose, which is an aldose, and I change the H group in um, glucose, and I change it to something else, then I'm going to get fructose. So that might not make sense a lot, but what I want you to know from now, from the slide, is that fructose is a ketose, and it is specifically the ketose version of glucose. You have to know that it's a ketose which means that it has this functional group over here. That's as much, you don't need to know how to draw or anything like that, but I just want you to know at least that much that fructose is a ketose and that glucose is an aldose. So you're going to see that again over here, they've just categorized it over here where they have all of your aldoses at the top row and then they have the ketoses 
over here at the bottom row. And so they're just showing you that I can have something like glyceraldehyde, which is an aldose, and all I need to do is remove this H and add some other group, and now I've converted it to a ketose. So these two have the same molecular formula. Molecular formula means that if I count all the carbons and I count all the oxygens and I count all the hydrogens, the number of all those atoms is going to be the same over here, the same number of carbons, same number of oxygen, same number of hydrogens as compared to over here. They have the same number of all those things, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It's just that they're arranged differently. By arranged differently, I mean their covalent bonds, which are these lines over here, are different, right? So their structures are different pretty much. Um, so I think you guys should know this for your exam, like that glyceraldehyde is an aldose. You'll be able to identify it really easily because it's aldehyde is in its group. So that should give you a really big clue that it's an aldose. Similarly, anytime you hear acetone, I want you to think ketone. Anytime you see acetone at the end of something that tells you it's a ketone. Um, and then you guys should know this as well, that ribose is an aldose and that the ketone version of ribose is called ribulose. I'm going to be quizzing you that on later on, so make sure you're keeping that in your head. Ribose is an aldose, and the ketone version of that is ribulose. And then this is a little bit of revision, but I told you that glucose is also an aldose. This is new, but galactose is also an aldose. And I told you that there is a ketone version of glucose. What was the name of that? Exactly, fructose. Fructose is the ketone version of glucose. So that's good. And these are the main ones that I think you should know. I don't think you need to know this entire thing. Okay, so now, remember I kept warning you that there's going to be a slide that's kind of hard. We are at that slide, but I'm going to try to explain this in the simplest way possible. Um, and any point that you feel like you're not keeping up, just stop me and I'll go over it. Cause I feel like this is kind of the most important side of the entire lecture. Um, so pretty much we have these things called isomers. Isomers have the same molecular formula. Remember molecular formula is, is this thingy over here. It means that I count my carbons, I count my hydrogens, I count my oxygens, and I see like how much there are in total. So I can have structures that have the same molecular formula but they're actually different in structure, AKA when I write them out in the molecular formula the same, but when I draw them, they actually look different. Um, and you can see this is sort of a revision of the previous point, but I have glyceraldehyde, which is an aldehyde, which is C3H6O3. And then I have uh, dihydroxyacetone, which is a ketone. And again, the molecular formula is the same, but if I draw it out, they look different, right? There is another example that I, we just went over, but I'm gonna quiz you guys again. What is an aldose that we just talked about? And what is a ketone that we just talked about? Give me an example of it. Um, glucose and fructose. Exactly, glucose is an aldose and fructose is a ketone. And so what I call these things is I call these constitutional isomers. So same molecular formula, but different structures. Another, um, name you might hear about this, and again, I'm going to quiz you on this, is structural isomers. Structural isomers have the same molecular formula, but different structures, okay? So, yeah, glucose and fructose is an example of constitutional isomers. That's kind of the easy one. We got constitutional isomers out of the way. Now let's move on to stereoisomers, okay? Stereoisomers also, again, still have the same molecular formula, okay? But this time, their bonds, aka their covalent bonds, are also the same, right? The only difference is that they are arranged differently in space. So the covalent bonds are the same, like the carbon is still going to be attached to the same exact group between two different stereoisomers. The only difference is that if I imagine this in 3D, the orientation of the molecule is going to differ a little bit. Okay, it's gonna make a little bit more sense as I keep going, but there are two types of stereoisomers. First, we're gonna go over enantiomers, and then there's a second call, there's a second one called di I diastereoisomers. Okay. But before I explain either of these two, I want to go over what a chiral carbon is, because this is so important. And I think once you understand chiral carbons, the rest is gonna be easier. Okay, so I need you guys to know this. This is so important. 
A chiral carbon is a carbon that is attached to four groups and all of those groups have to be different. Okay, so you can notice this carbon over here is attached to four groups and each group is different. Both of those criteria have to be met for something to be a chiral carbon. Okay, that's really important. Make sure you got that in your brain right now. A chiral carbon is something that is attached to four different groups, four groups, and each group has to be different. Okay, there can be no repetition. Okay, that is what a chiral carbon is. Let's try to practice that. Okay, so I have a structure over here that you're gonna see again at the next slide, but I want you guys to practice what a chiral carbon is. So, one second, let me just pen. Okay, the, at the top, the first C over here, let's look at this carbon and let's try to figure out, is this a chiral carbon or is this what we call an achiral carbon? So pretty much, is it not chiral? Let's look at the criteria. I said I have two criteria. One of them is that it has to be attached to four different groups. You guys tell me, this carbon right over here, this first one, is it attached to four different groups? No, no, right? It's only attached to three groups. One, exactly. One, two, three. So this is not a chiral carbon, okay? C1 is not a chiral carbon. Let's skip this middle one for now. Let's go to the bottom one, okay? Let's go over here. Let's see, I have C, this carbon. Is it attached? So remember, I have two criteria, okay? So don't jump. I have two criteria. One of them is that it has to be attached to four groups. Is this attached to four groups? Yes, it is attached to four groups. One, two, three, four. However, are each of these groups different? Or do I have a group that's repeating? Are each of these groups different? Yeah. Exactly. They're not there. I have an H that is repeating. So is this carbon C3, is it chiral or not chiral? No, it's not chiral. This is really important. Okay, you guys are getting it fast. That's really good. Now let's move on to this C in the middle. Okay, so does it meet the first criteria? Is it attached to four different groups? Yes. And is Sorry, is it attached to four groups and are each of those groups different? Yes. yes. Okay, you guys are saying yes, which is good, but I just wanna make sure that nobody's confused on how I identify which one is a group. This is a group, right? So this is one group. This entire thing is one functional group. This is really important because it's gonna get confusing later on. This entire thing is one functional group and this entire thing is one functional group. So when I say that this carbon is attached to four different groups, don't get mixed up. Don't think that, oh, it's attached to a C over here and also it's attached to a C over here. That does not matter. You need to treat everything as just one group. And because this entire group at the top and this entire group at the bottom is not identical, I'm still going to treat this as two separate groups. Is that clear? Because that can get confusing for some people. Yeah, clear. clear. Okay. If it's not clear, I'm going to practice it with you guys. So we'll make sure. But um, okay, yeah. So now we have stereoisomers. We're going to specifically talk about enantiomers. What I want you to look at for enantiomers is that I again have two criteria. One is non superimposable. Non superimposable is a really fancy way of saying that they're not identical. Okay, it, I'm not dealing with the exact same molecule. I have to make sure that I'm not just dealing with the exact same molecule. Technically, what non-superimposable means is that you can stack them on each other. And if you stack them on each other, that they don't lay perfectly on top of each other. Because obviously, if two things are identical, if I stack them, they're going to be imposed on each other. But the easier way to think of it is non-superimposable means that they're not identical. The second part is that they have to be mirror images. This is where things can get a little, little bit confusing and why I focus so much on the chiral part. Okay, when I'm talking about what's getting married, you have to specifically look at the chiral carbon and look at its groups. And like I emphasized a lot before, treat each functional group as just one whole thing. Don't look at it and don't break it down like as, oh, there's a C over here, there's a C over here. No, no, no. You have to treat this entire thing 
It's just one group. If it makes it easier for you on an exam, I would literally just take a paper and I would just rewrite like R on this entire thing or R prime or H or whatever, but make sure you're treating this entire thing as one group. This is one group, this is one group, this is one group, right? This is the same structure as before, by the way. So this is the chiral carbon that we talked about before. So when I say mirror image, I want to look at my structure and just see, so imagine I'm drawing a plane over here. Let me get my, imagine I'm drawing a line over here and this line is the mirror, right? So if you look at it, you can notice that, for example, this OH group, because it's closer to the mirror, this OH group on this side is also closer to the mirror. And you can notice that everything is being mirrored. This entire group is at the bottom over here. This entire group is at the bottom over here. This group is at the top. This group is at the is at the top, this H is far away from the mirror, and then this H is far away from the mirror. Keep in mind, I only look at the mirroring of the chiral group. Don't look at this C, for example, because we already talked about the C is not, um, this C is not a chiral carbon. And so I'm not going to look at this chiral carbon and go, oh, this O is on this side, and this O is also on this side. That doesn't make sense. It's not being mirrored. No, that's not how we do it. It's not a chiral carbon. You don't treat it that way. You only treat it as one entire group. And because this entire group is at the top over here, you're gonna still treat it at the top over here. That's all that matters, the entire group, okay? Just treat it as one entire thing. So you can appreciate that over here, I have a mirror image, but it's not the exact same image. The reason I'm saying it's not the exact same image is because if it was, then I would have the OH on this side over here. Don't worry too much about that, but I just wanna make sure that the concept I want you guys to be able to see what is being mirrored. Can you guys see that? Do you guys understand what I mean by mirror images? Yeah. And then I'm only treating it in terms of the chiral carbon. Okay. There is one other thing uh, that I also want to go over, which is that how do you name different enantiomers? Um, so in enantiomers or in stereoisomers in general, I can either call them a D stereoisomer or I can call them an L stereoisomer. And the way that you do that is really easy. Just take the hydroxyl group that is farthest away from the carbonyl group. So in this case, I only have one hydroxyl group, so it's easy. But you take the hydroxyl group that is farthest away from the carbonyl group and you ask yourself, is it on the left side or is it on the right side of this carbonyl group? If it's on the right side, it's a D um, stereoisomer. And if it's on the left side, then it's an L stereoisomer. So you guys tell me for this first one, is it D glyceraldehyde or is it L glyceraldehyde? It's D. It's D, yeah, that's got it right. And then what about the next one? L. Okay, that's it for enantiomers. Again, they're non superimposable, aka they're not identical, and they have to be mirror images. Keep in mind when I say mirror images, I'm talking about in respect to the chiral carbon. Okay, so next I have diaster isomers, which are not mirror images. Okay, here is one thing that I need to be so clear diaster isomers can only exist if more than one chiral carbon is there, okay? I need to have a molecule that has more than one chiral carbon for it to be even eligible to be a diaster isomers. So for example, in this previous drawing, how many chiral carbons did I have? One, right? I only had one chiral carbon, it's this one in the middle. You guys remember in the previous slide, we figured it out together. So no way, no matter how many different ways that I arrange this molecule in space, I'm never going to get a diaster isomer, okay? Because it only has one chiral carbon and you need two chiral carbons for it to be eligible of a diaster isomer. Okay, so let's talk about, or before I do that, actually, I wanna practice the D and the L thing again. So if you remember the way that I told you that you guys can do it is that you have an hydroxyl group that is farthest away from the carbonyl. So this is my carbonyl group up here. And I take the hydroxyl group that is farthest away from it. 
And I asked myself, is it on the left side or is it on the right side? So for this one over here for altros, is this D altros or is this L altros? Yeah, good, it's D altros. And then what about um, this one for glucose? Mm -hmm. Okay, one person said L. Let's look at this closely. I'm taking the hydroxyl group that is farthest away from my carbonyl. And I'm asking myself, is it on the left or is it on the right side? In this case, it's on the right side of my carbonyl group. And if it's on the right side, it means it's D. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that's clear. I just wanted to make that part was clear. Okay. So now I didn't even explain what diaster isomers are. So now they're, so now we're going to go over it in this next one. Um, sorry. Okay. So pretty much what diaster. So first of all, actually, let's pause for a second. Let's try to count. Let's try to figure out which carbons in this structure over here are chiral carbons. Okay. So for example, this top one over here, which remember is the same structure of over here, this first carbon, is it a chiral carbon? Remember this looks like this, this is the same thing. No, why isn't a chiral carbon? What criteria doesn't it meet? Does not have four bonds, exactly. So this is not a chiral carbon. Okay, what about this thing over here, which by the way, is the same thing, CH2OH is this thing at the bottom over here. Okay, CH2OH, is this one at the bottom a chiral carbon? No, and why, why? what's the rationale? Why isn't it a chiral carbon? Bonds to hydrogen twice, okay, good, exactly. Somebody says it's 3H, that's not, technically the hydroxyl is considered its own group. OH is fine, that would consider its own thing. But the fact that it has H specifically twice, that's why, exactly, you got it. Okay, so now let's go through this. So let's do with C2, carbon over carbon two. Does, is it a chiral carbon? Does it have four different groups? So keep in mind, this entire thing is one group. Keep in mind, don't let that trip you up. Yes, okay. I don't know how to erase, but what about um, this carbon over here, C3? Is that a chiral carbon? Okay, I think I see one response. Yes. I don't see a lot of responses, so I'm just going to explain it just in case. But this C, three over here is a chiral carbon because it has one group over here, one group over here, one group over here, and one group over here. And none of them are identical. Even this top and bottom one, I know is a little bit intimidating, but just look at it. It's not identical. I have one, two, three Cs over here. I have only one, two Cs over there. Automatically, I know it's not identical. Um, what about C4? Is it is C4 a chiral carbon? Yes, C4 is a chiral carbon. C4 is this one over here. We have one group up top over here, one group over here, one group over here, one group over here. All of them are different, four different groups. So I have four different chiral carbons, okay, in um, this molecule of altros over here. Sorry, let me just erase everything. Okay, now that I know that I have four different chiral carbons, this is why I had to specify so much that I need more than one chiral carbon for it to be considered a diastomer. The thing is with the diastomer, the criteria is that like if I have more than one chiral carbons, at least one of them has to be a mirror image and at least one of them has to be identical. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what that looks like. If I go over here, this segment over here, look at it closely, and this segment over here, are these mirror images or are these identical? 
try to imagine identical. a mirror. They're identical, right? Yeah, exactly. And then what about these ones up top over here? And keep in mind, everything that I'm doing so far has been a chiral carbon. We already established all of these four are chiral carbons. Yes, these two in the red box over here, are they mirror images or are they identical? They're the mirror box. images. They're mirror images. So it, right, I can see that I have some chiral carbons that are identical. I have some chiral carbons that are mirror images. If that specific thing happens, now I can call it a diastereomer, okay? Um, and then specifically within diastereomers, I actually have two other subclasses, okay? One of them is called an epimer. An epimer means that only one chiral carbon, remember we already established these four are chiral carbons, only one of them is a mirror image. The rest of them have to be identical. So hopefully you can appreciate that over here. The red box is a mirror image and the whole rest of my molecule, all of the other chiral carbons are identical. So an epimer is when only one chiral carbon is a mirror image. So super important, okay? And then I also have anomers. You should be able to identify anomers very easily. They're pretty much ring structures. So what happens is that carbon one, okay, which is up here, and then carbon five are actually going to form a bond with each other and they're going to create this ring. Okay, I'm gonna show it to you guys later on again, but just understand that this linear structure over here can form a ring because the carbon one and carbon five are gonna attach and they're gonna form this ring over here. Okay, once that happens, remember how we talked about before guys, was carbon one, was it chiral or was it achiral? Uh, it was achiral, right? But now once it becomes a ring, now it actually starts to, carbon one is over here and it actually starts to meet the criteria of becoming a chiral carbon. And we call that specific chiral carbon an anomeric carbon. So the carbon that's in the ring structure and used to be achiral, but now became chiral is called the anomeric carbon and it's this carbon over here. And the thing is that once this bond forms between carbon one and carbon five, there's kind of a random chance of where the hydroxyl group is gonna go. They can either go at the bottom or the hydroxyl group can go at the top. Again, I'm gonna expand a little bit more on this later, but what I need you guys to know is that this linear structure can form a ring. The ring is called a pyranose ring. Pyranose is a six carbon ring, okay? Um, and the pyranose ring is going to have this carbon over here at C1, which is what we call an anomeric carbon. And it's pretty much a carbon that is now chiral. And the reason it's important is because I need to assess where is the hydroxyl group in relation to this carbon? Is it below or is it at the top? Okay. Uh, I have a question. So uh, yeah. the, the first carbon in the epimers, it's not chiral? This, you're talking about this one right over here? Uh, no, the, the second one. This one, C2. Oh. oh, so the first one is CHO, not the, not HCOH. Yeah, carbon one is this one up here and CHO. Oh, okay. I, I thought you meant uh, carbon two, if it is chiral or not. Oh, okay. No, so carbon one is this one up top. Yeah. Can you Let's please explain? Okay, does that make sense? Yes, because it's only attached to, uh, to three, uh, three elements, exactly. not four. The exactly. O and the H and the carbon. Yeah. Okay. Um, so people are asking me to repeat the part about anomers. Okay, so keep in mind, I can only talk about anomers if there's a ring. That's the first thing. If you're in an MCQ, it's asking you what is the anomeric carbon or whatever, and there's multiple options and the options are linear, automatically just cross them out. Okay, I needs anomeric isomers only exist in ring format. That's one thing that you need to know. Anomeric carbons only exist in rings. And the specific six carbon ring is called a pure pyranus ring. The second thing of what an anomeric carbon is, is my anomeric carbon is this carbon, C1, okay? 
that used to be achiral. It's achiral because it's only attached to three groups. But once the ring was formed, it now became chiral. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. It has oxygen, which is one group. Um, oh, I think maybe what's confusing people is that they don't draw the hydrogen. So there actually is a hydrogen sticking out over here. But in drawings, they usually don't draw it. So I have four different groups. One, two, three, four. Okay, so I have carbon one that used to only be attached to three things. But now carbon one, after it formed a ring, is attached to four things. This oxygen over here, hydrogen up here, hydroxyl over here, and then this carbon over here. Okay, so now that it's a fact attached to four different groups, I can now call it a chiral carbon, but specifically this chiral carbon that is part of a ring that used to be achiral and now became chiral, I call that the anomeric carbon. The anomeric carbon is the carbon that used to be achiral, but now became chiral. Is that clear what an anomeric carbon is? It used to be achiral and now it's chiral. That's the main concept. And that it's part of a ring. I think as long as you know those two things are good. Okay. Okay, so remember we talked about epimers, right? And I told you that by definition, an epimer is when I have multiple chiral carbons and only one of those chiral carbons is a mirror image. The rest of those chiral carbons are all identical. So I'm going to tell you right now, glucose and galactose are both, they are epimers of each other, okay? But I want you guys to tell me Look at these two structures, count the carbons, and tell me at which carbon are they mirror images of each other? Are they epimers? So the way that you say that they are epimers at carbon something. Okay, I see two responses. Does anybody else want to respond? You can take a minute, it's okay. Okay, so I think you guys are getting it. It's carbon four. So let's look at it. So this is the carbon four in glucose, it's the carbon four in galactose. You can appreciate that they're mirror images over here, but at all of the other ones, they're identical. And so because they're only mirror images at one point, we call this epimers. Okay, that's good. Okay, now we're just gonna review. Um, to be honest, that was the hardest part. So if you guys are keeping up up until now, that's really good. Um, so I'm gonna quiz you guys and you guys can stop me at any time you feel like. Yeah, I can send you guys a presentation at the end. But um, I'm just gonna ask you guys some questions and like have you guys fill in the blanks or whatever. Okay, so for the first one, if they have the same chemical formula, but different arrangements, arrangements, I'm not talking about spatial arrangements, arrangements, I'm saying covalent bonds, different structures, same chemical formula, but different structures, what kind of isomers are they? What's the name of that kind of isomer? No. Constitution? Yeah, it's constitutional. It's not stereoisomers. Oh my gosh. Remember, stereoisomers are different in spatial arrangement. But that's not what I was asking. I was asking which ones are different in order of their attachments, in order of their covalent bonds. And those are constitutional isomers. Okay, so let me just go back to the slide. So, same chemical formula, but they differ in their covalent arrangements and their covalent bonds, not their 3D ones. That's not what I'm talking about. So those ones are constitutional or also called structural isomers. Is that clear what a structural isomer is? Okay. And then what if they have the same chemical formula, the same sequence of bonds, aka the same covalent bonds, but their three-dimensional orientation is different. What is the class of isomers that I'm talking about? Stereoisomers. Yes, now we're talking about stereoisomers. Okay, what kind of stereoisomers are mirror images of each other? Uh, enantiomers. Enantiomers, perfect. Okay, this is just something I'm going to quiz you guys on later, so make sure you guys are paying attention. But the main, remember how I told you guys 
how we figure out if something is D-glucose or L-glucose. You look at the last hydroxyl group and then you see it's on the left side or the right side of the carbonyl group. Um, the main version of glucose that our body uses is a D-glucose, okay? D-glucose. It's important just for MCQs, just to know. So the main one that our body needs to use is D-glucose. Um, okay, and what do I call stereoisomers that only are a mirror image at one carbon? Only one of their chiral carbons are mirror images. The rest are identical. What's that called? Epimers. Perfect. They're epimers. Okay, so again, just a little bit of revision. If you guys remember, I told you guys that um, glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone are um, constitutional isomers. One of these is an aldose and one of these is a ketose. Is glyceraldehyde a ketose or is it an aldose? Aldose. aldose? Exactly. And what about dihydroxyacetone? Ketose. Perfect. Okay, um, and then let's just practice this one more time. I know you guys are probably getting sick of it, but I want to make sure it's in your brains when you walk into the exam and it's like so easy. This one over here, the one at the left, is it D-glucose or L-glucose? D-glucose. Perfect. And what about the one next to it? L-glucose. Perfect. Okay. And this is just emphasizing the main concept. So I told you that most of the glucose that our body uses is in the D format, aka it looks like this, not like this. And in general, that's just kind of true for all the carbohydrates that we use. They're usually in this format, the D glucose or the D orientation. Again, that's just good to know for an MCQ. And then we already went over this. If they're mirror images, they are enantiomers. Okay, so remember I told you there were two criteria to be in antimers. What are the two criteria? Well, somebody has a question. Yeah, you can ask. Um, in the previous slide, if the O and H arrangement is, is flipped, does this affect if it's gonna be L or D? If the O arrangement, do you mean this O up here? I mean, yeah. No, because you treat, when I look at it, I look at it in respect of the carbonyl group, which is this entire thing. So where the O is within the carbonyl group doesn't matter. I just look at the entire carbonyl group, which is usually at the top. And I just see, is this hydroxyl group to the left of it or is it to the right? So treat it like the entire thing. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so going back to enantiomers, remember I told you there was two criteria for enantiomers. Non-superimposable, good, that's one of them. And what's the second one? They have to be what kind of images? Mirror images. Mirror images, perfect. Okay. Um, this is another concept that they want you to know. So if I compare enantiomers to diastiomers, Enantiomers have the same um, have the same like chemical properties. So, for example, water solubilities, but diastiomers have different chemical properties. For example, water solubility. I'm going to explain why later, but just for right now, just keep in mind. Let me go back. Just keep in mind that enantiomers have the same chemical properties but diastiomers have different chemical properties. I'm going to explain why later, but just keep in mind. Okay. Um, and then, so I've, I've told you guys this about before, but the most of the carbohydrates that we use, are they in L form or are they in D form? D. D, perfect. Okay, you guys got it. Okay, so what are the kind of stereoisomers that are not mirror images? What do I call those kind of stereoisomers? What's the name of them? Diastomers. Perfect, diastomers. And I told you just right now that diastomers have different physical properties. And I'm going to explain. 
to the next slide why that is. So pretty much if I look at enantiomers, right? Think about how each of these groups relate to each other. Because enantiomers are mirror images, the way that each group, so for example, the way that this hydroxyl group is going to interact with this carbonyl group, the way that this carbonyl group is going to interact with this hydro hydrogen is going to be the same because they're mirror images of each other, okay? All of these interactions are gonna be the same. What I mean by that is that like, if this is slightly positive, the hydrogen is slightly positive, and this oxygen is slightly negative, then that is also going to be the same. Well, actually that's a bad example, but just keep in mind that the way that enantiomers interact with each other is kind of the same because they're mirror images. So they're gonna interact similarly. Um, on the other hand, diastomers, because they have some that are mirror images and some that aren't, the way that they're going to interact with each other is going to look different. So for example, look at this section over here. And then look at this section over here, right? Hydroxyl groups are slightly negative versus hydrogen groups are slightly positive. And so you can kind of appreciate that this diastomer is going to be slightly more negative on its right side compared to this diastomer, which is going to be slightly more positive because I have this hydrogen that I don't have over here. And so the reason that's important, why do I care about slight negativities? Why do I care about slight positivities? Because depending on how negative or how slightly positive or how slightly negative a molecule is, that determines certain properties of it for example, its solubility. And the reason for that is because the reason that things dissolve in water is because they're polar, right? And so pretty much what I'm trying to get at is that diastomers have slightly different polarities. And because of the slightly different polarities, this is going to affect their chemical properties. And an example of a chemical property is water solubility. Okay, so enantiomers have the same chemical properties diastomers have different chemical properties. Is that clear? Even if you don't understand the rationale, you don't have to, but at least that point, is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so again, just going over definitions again, epimers. Epimers are, again, two sugars and they only are, um, mirror images around how many carbons? How many chiral carbons? One. One, yes. Only one chiral carbon. Are they gonna be mirror images? Okay, so I want you guys to look at this bottom part over here. I have glucose and glucose is an epimer of mannose because if you look at C2, they're mirror images, but the rest, of the molecule is identical. So that makes them epimers, specifically epimers at C2. And then glucose and galactose, we already figured it out together that they are also epimers because they're mirror images at C4, but completely identical to the rest of the molecule. Okay, so just to be clear, glucose is an epimer of mannose at C2, and glucose is an epimer of galactose at C4. Have a question for you. Does this mean mannose and galactose are epimers of each other? Uh, no. 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 Good job. Okay. Didn't trick you. Why? Because they aren't, they aren't epimers of each other. They're epimers of glucose. Yeah. But the definition of an epimer is that they have to differ only at one chiral carbon, right? Yes. How many? So between galactose and mannose, they differ at two chiral carbons. Now I have C2 that is a mirror image. Look at galactose over here. It's a mirror image of C2 over here. And then again at C4, I have a mirror image over here. And I have a mirror image over here. So mannose and galactose are not ephemers of each other because they differ at two chiral carbons, not just one. That's clear, right? So they are diastomers of each other. Yes, yes, perfect. Yeah, you're really understanding it. 
Okay, I don't think this part's that uh, important. It just tells you that there are different ways that we can draw things. We can either have the Fisher projection, which is the straight one. You can have a Haworth projection, which is a form of a ring one. And then this really complicated one, which is a chair one, which I hope they don't give you on the exam. But I think you should just be able to recognize at least that when I have all these weird bends, that's a chair projection. Um, but now we're sort of leaning into what I had touched upon before, which is that if I have a linear molecule like this, it can eventually form bonds and become a ring. So that's important. And then the linear structure is what we call fissure. At least the drawing is called a fissure. And then when I draw it as a ring, I can call that a Haworth projection. Okay, so I touched upon this before, but I really want you guys to see that look at carbon one over here and look at the hydroxyl group that is sticking off of carbon five over here. You can kind of appreciate that the hydroxyl group of carbon five is going to go and it's going to form a covalent bond at C1. Do you see how that's happening over here? The pink is carbon one and that the blue is um, carbon five. And that's how the ring is formed. You can kind of see that what that creates is a five carbon ring. Well, technically a six carbon ring, but look at where the sixth one is. It's kind of sticking out over here. I just want you guys to notice that. So that's how something goes from linear until it becomes a ring structure. And then the other thing is that let's look at the anomeric carbon again. So I told you that C1 before, used to be a chiral and it's in the linear structure, but then a bonds are formed. And after it forms its bonds, it meets the criteria to become chiral because I have one, two, three, four different groups. And so C1 used to be a chiral and now it's chiral. And specifically when a carbon does that, where it is a chiral, in the linear form, but then becomes chiral in the ring form, I call that my anomeric carbon. So my anomeric carbon is a chiral carbon, but specifically the one that used to be a chiral in the linear form. Okay, the reason that we're talking about this, like why does it matter? Why do I care about an anomeric carbon? Why am I putting so much emphasis on it? Is because you need to look at where the hydroxyl group is in relation to this functional group at the top, AKA carbon six. So if the hydroxyl group is on the opposite side, so if so either this hydroxyl group can be up top over here where the hydrogen is, or it can be at the bottom over here. Okay, but this functional group, this C6 is always gonna be up top over here. It's never gonna be at the bottom, okay? And so what you need to see is you need to look at this hydroxyl group and is it at the same side? So AKA, is it at the top pretty much? Because this thing is always gonna be at the top. And so I need to look at, is my hydroxyl group also at the top? Which is what I call cis formation. Cis means same side. And because they're both at the top, I'm gonna to call this cis. Or is it trans location? Which means that they're at different locations. In this case, the hydroxyl group is at the bottom, but my C6 is at the top. So um, you guys tell me, is this cis or trans? This is trans. Trans, right? Because I have my C6 yeah, at the top? So that yeah. means it's alpha. Sorry? So that means it's alpha. If Perfect, it's, uh, yeah. If it's beta, it's, uh, it's uh, what, what was it? Cis, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. If, if um, so what he said is correct. So if it's a translocation, that means that it's an alpha form. But if my hydroxyl was up here, that would be called what we call a cis location. Again, cis in relation to carbon cis, six. And that's what we call the beta form. Beta is cis, beta is the same side, but alpha is trans, alpha is opposite sides, okay? So this molecule over here, this form of glucose, is it alpha or is it beta? It's alpha. It's alpha, right? Because I have my carbon six up here, that's at the top, but I have my hydroxyl group, which is at the bottom, which means that they're on opposite sides, which means translocation, which means it's the alpha version. Okay, 
Is that clear? Does anyone want me to repeat? Clear? OK, good. Um, so I think just one more thing that they want you to know is that at pH 7.4, this version is what is um, predominating. This is the major version of glucose or whatever carbohydrate. I think glucose specifically um, is the major version at pH 7.4. Why do we care? Why do we care about pH 7.4? Does anybody know what in our body is at a pH of 7.4? Because uh, our uh, blood acidity is at 7.4. Exactly, exactly. Which means that the main version of glucose in our blood is this one, is this ring one. Again, I think that's just good for an MCQ question. This ring version of glucose is the main version that predominates in our blood because our blood is at a pH of 7.4. Okay. And then I don't think I talked about this, but um, once I have my ring structure, I can either have a six carbon ring, which is what I have over here, which we're going to call a pyranose. But if there was only five carbons, five carbons in total, by the way, it's like including the sixth one up here. Okay. So there's only five carbons in total, then I would call that a furanose. So pyranose means I have six carbons and that it's a ring with six carbons and furanose is a five carbon ring, okay? I'm gonna quiz you on that later, so I hope you're paying attention. Okay, um, what do we call the carbonyl carbon or the achyl carbon that now became a new chiral carbon? What's that carbon called? Anomeric. Perfect, it's called the anomeric carbon. Okay, and then in terms of orientation, if the hydroxyl group is on the opposite side or on the trans side of this functional group, does that mean it's alpha or it's the beta configuration? Alpha. alpha. Yeah, trans is alpha and cis is beta by default then. Okay, perfect. Okay, they're just showing it um, again over here. We can see carbon five hydroxyl is going to form with the carbon one. This carbon one eventually when I go all the way down here. So this is what I call a carbonyl group, if you remember. So this carbonyl group now becomes an anomeric carbon. That's sort of the main concept that's going on over here. And I've explained why it's achiral over here. And I've explained why it's chiral over here. And I've also explained um, why it's important. I need to look at the hydroxyl group in relation to this functional group up top. So you guys tell me, the one on the left, is it alpha or is it beta? Alpha. Yeah, it's alpha. Does anybody else want to respond? You can write in the chat as well. I just want to make sure nobody's lost. Alpha. And then what about the one on the right? Is that alpha or is it beta? Good. It's beta. Because they're on the same side. The hydroxyl group is up top, and this functional group appears up top. So same side, cis meets as beta. Perfect. Okay, you guys remember how I told you guys that if I form a ring and there's six carbons. What do I call that ring? What's the special name of that ring? Perfect, Pyranos. And then what do I call it if it's only five carbons? Mm, pentose is what I would call the sugar, but specifically for the ring. Hmm? Furanos? Furanos, yeah. Pentose is, tech yeah, pentose is technically right. But I want the specifically for the ring. What do I call it? And specifically, it's furanos. Yep, you guys got it right. Um, okay, over here. So now we're going to talk about monosaccharides, which are structures like glucose and fructose. 
And we're going to talk about how they can form structures over here called disaccharides. So monosaccharide means just one sugar. So for example, glucose, fructose are monosaccharide because it's just one sugar. But if they bond together, it can have a structure that has two sugars and we call that a disaccharide. Di means two, um, saccharide means sugar. Okay, so what I want you guys to get comfortable with is how to name the bonds, how to name this bond that it's about to form. Okay, so pretty much one of the things that you need to know in the bond is you need to first identify what kind of glucose is it? Is it an alpha glucose or is it a beta glucose? Okay, that's one thing that I can quiz you on. Um, the second thing is that you need to be comfortable numbering your carbons. Okay, so those are the two things that we're going to practice. So one is in your bond, always be sure to recognize, am I looking at an alpha configuration or am I looking at a beta configuration? And we went over how to do that. Um, and the second thing you want to do is get comfortable naming your carbons. So with six carbon molecules, it's actually very easy. All you have to do is look for the oxygen and look for the next carbon that's at an angle. So the bond has to be an angle. Okay, so don't go to the one that's perfectly horizontal to it. That means like you're going backwards. The first carbon, carbon one, is the carbon that is at an angle to the oxygen. So in this case, this is carbon one, right over here. Okay, and then if I have a five ring structure, which fructose is a five ring structure, if you remember, it's a ketone, um, just look for the carbon that is attached to um, this thing up top, CH2OH, and that is also attached to a hydroxyl, okay? And that is actually going to be carbon two, not carbon one, it's gonna be carbon two. Okay, so the reason I'm specifying this is because look at this fructose over here, okay? if you look at this side over here, I have this exact same group. I have CH2OH, but it's also attached to a hydrogen. It's not attached to a hydroxyl group. So I know that this is not C2. I need to find a carbon that is attached to a CH2OH and is also attached to an OH. And automatically that is going to tell you that it's carbon two. Okay. Is that clear how we number carbons? Because they can change up the orientation. They can, you know, move the sugar around. So that's why I'm trying to make sure that you guys are able to recognize how to number carbons. Is that clear how we number carbons? Can you repeat the one for fructose? Yeah, so fructose is a five carbon uh, structure. And what you need to look for is you need to look at all your carbons. Each of these points is a carbon by the way, okay? And look for your carbons and look for one that is attached to CH2OH and is also attached to a hydroxyl group, an OH group. And that is going to be carbon two. Carbon two is attached to both CH2OH and also OH. And then once you find carbon two, it becomes really easy. Carbon two is here, this is gonna be carbon three, four, five, six. Carbon one is the one that's up here. Okay, I get it, thank you. Okay. And somebody asked, why is it beta? Okay, so that is a really good question. Um, for beta, you are still looking at the hydroxyl group. Beta says, yeah, yeah, okay. So look for the hydroxyl group. So the one that we talked about is attached to carbon two. And then look on the opposite side for this group over here, CH2OH. And that is going to be your carbon six. Okay, and you need to compare, is my carbon six on the same side of my hydroxyl group or is it on the opposite side? So in this case, is it on the same side of my carbon six or is it on the opposite side? You guys tell me. This structure over here that's on the bottom and then this side here, which is also on the bottom. Yeah, it's the same one, right? So it's six, cis configuration and because it's cis configuration that means it's beta okay so make sure you find carbon six i told you how to find carbon six this one over here 
and then compare it to the hydroxyl group on the other side, and then just see, is the hydroxyl group on the same side or is it on the opposite side? If it's on the same side, then it's beta. If it's on the opposite side, it's alpha. Okay, so the reason that I've been going over this is because it's important for um, naming the bonds. So when you hear the name of this bond, the way that they're gonna describe it is they're gonna tell you alpha one, because carbon one is being attached. And then they're gonna draw an arrow like this, like two. Beta two, because it's carbon two that's being attached, fructose. Okay, so pretty much we have to see what is reacting, which in this case is this part right over here. And it's C1, it's the C1 of glucose and the C2 of fructose. So it's important in naming it. I just want you guys to be able to understand like what they mean when they say this part over here. So one to two means that the carbon one of glucose is attaching to the carbon two of fructose. And they also might mention if it's alpha, if it's D or L and all the kind of stuff. Does that make sense? How do we name a bond? Yeah, okay, hopefully. And then the other thing I just want you to know is that if a glucose and a fructose combine, it makes a sucrose. I'm gonna quiz you guys on that later. So glucose plus fructose is gonna equal sucrose. Um, the way that I always think of that is sucrose, I always think means sweet and fructose always means fruits. So I'm like, fruits are sweet. So that means like glucose plus fructose is going to give us sucrose. Okay, so sucrose is a disaccharide. Here are some other combinations that you can get. Um, keep in mind, I didn't write if it's alpha, if it's carbon one, if it's carbon whatever but we are going to go over that later. But I just want you guys to, to be introduced to the concept that if I add a glucose plus a fructose, I'm going to get a disaccharide called sucrose by glucose plus the lactose. I can make lactose, which is another disaccharide. And there's a third disaccharide that they want you to know about, which is a glucose, let's say glucose, and it's going to give you a cellulose polymer, which is pretty much the disaccharide version of cellulose. Right? So this is the disaccharide version of cellulose. Okay, so glucose plus lactose is lactose. The other thing I want you just to be familiar with, we're going to go over it later, but this bond is an alpha one four bond. So the glucose, the first carbon of glucose and the fourth carbon of the lactose are going to connect to make a lactose. And we call that an alpha one four bond. And then this one at the bottom over here is also going to be an alpha 1,4 bond. It's only this middle one, glucose plus fructose, that is an alpha 1,2 bond. And the reason that this one is special is because fructose is a ketone. We've been talking about since the beginning, it's a ketone. And so instead of the fourth carbon, it's going to be the second carbon. Okay, so you don't have to memorize that yet, but I want you to be familiar with the idea. And the other thing that I'm going to go over later is that a 1,4 bond is linear. Just keep that at the back of your mind. Whenever you hear a 1,4 bond, 1,4, that the first carbon of something is attaching to the fourth carbon of another molecule, it's linear. I'm gonna explain what that means later, but I just want you to be aware of it. Okay, so this is just um, the same thing, except this time we're doing glucose plus galactose. And you can appreciate that I have my carbon one of galactose and it's attaching to the carbon four of my glucose, right? That's where the bond is forming. And so I call that a one four bond and that the shape of this is linear. Like look at these two molecules when they connect to each other, they just form a straight line. Okay, a one four bond is linear. That's also important. So yeah, glucose plus galactose equals lactose. Okay, um, give me some examples of monosaccharides. We've named a lot so far. Monosaccharide means just one sugar. So something like this, just one sugar. Glucose, yeah, that's a good one. Could you give me one more? Something that's an epimer of glucose, for example? Yeah, galactose. What about an epimer of glucose at C2? What's that called? 
Yeah, fructose is also a monosaccharide. Good. Fructose is also a ketone. Do you guys remember what the epimer of glucose at C2 was? This is really advanced, so you don't have to, but it was mannose. Mannose was the epimer at C2. You don't have to know, but just those are examples of monosaccharides. Give me some examples, or actually tell me sucrose is made up of glucose and what other monosaccharide? Perfect. Yeah, glucose and fructose make sucrose. Okay, then oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides is pretty much a couple of sugars. So oligo actually means few, or it means little, and poly actually means a lot. So when I say oligosaccharides, I mean a few sugars. So it's a short chain. So specifically between two and 10, again, I could see this coming up as an MCQ, so I would memorize that. Between two and 10 monosaccharides um, is when we classify it as an oligosaccharide. And if I have more than 10 monosaccharides attached to each other, now it's what we call a big sugar, and that's specifically called a polysaccharide. But it can literally go up to hundreds. Like polysaccharides are usually very giant. Okay, I think they're just trying to tell you that like um, the monosaccharides that are important are like the pentoses, the hexoses, like stuff like that. Those are the ones that are physiologically important. And we've already gone over a bunch of different type of hexoses, for example, um, you know, glucose, galactose, and that kind of stuff. Okay, so this is a review of something from the very beginning. But do you guys remember what the ketose version of ribose was? Does anyone remember what that was called? Ribulose? Perfect. Yeah, it's called ribulose. Yeah. Ooh, I uncovered that one. Oops. Okay, pretend you didn't see that. What is the aldose version of fructose? Glucose. Perfect, yeah. So you guys got those two. What do you call these kind of isomers, by the way, that have the same molecular formula, but different structures? What, are, what kind of isomers are those? Structural? Yes, perfect. Structural or constitutional, both are considered correct. And I think they just want you to be aware of what the significance of so, so ribose, I already told you from the beginning, the reason that RNA is called RNA is because it's ribo, nucleic acid. So the sugar that you see in RNA is actually ribose. Um, and then ribulose, I think you'll study in a different lecture, but it's part of the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay. Um, the rest of this, I think, is going to be fairly straightforward and a lot quicker. Again, you guys have done the hardest part. I'm really proud of you. So um, I'll just do some kind of easy questions, but what would you call a condition that has very elevated levels of glucose. What condition can you guys name as very high glucose or hyperglycemia? Diabetes. Is, perfect. Yeah. And usually we say diabetes mellitus because there's another kind of diabetes. Mellitus actually means sweet. Um, so it means that the urine is sweet. But anyways, yeah, diabetes mellitus. And then what disaccharide is galactose formed from? Lactose, perfect, right? Because glucose was lactose, it's gonna give me lactose. Okay, so remember how I told you this could easily be an MCQ? Oligosaccharides, how many monosaccharides do they have? How many monosaccharide units? Yeah, I see one answer, does anybody else? Hmm? Two to 10. Perfect, two to 10. Um, and the other thing they want you to know about um, oligosaccharides is that uh, there's a specific bond that's present called a beta one to four bond. So again, we went over what beta means. And we, I talked about what one to four means. So I'm talking about two glucose molecules and a beta one to four bond, which means a carbon one of one glucose and carbon four of another glucose are attaching to each other. Um, 
And what's interesting about the human body is that if this bond is present between two glucose molecules, a one to four bond, the human body can actually not break that down. We do not have an enzyme that breaks down the one to four bonds between glucose. And the reason that's important is that if you eat something, specifically if you eat cellulose, cellulose is predominantly beta one to four bonds. And so what that means is that if we eat cellulose and it's in our digestive tract, our body actually can't digest cellulose. And so it's just excreted through the feces. And it's actually something that's good for us because it means that we're taking a carbohydrate and that carbohydrate is never being broken down and the glucose is never absorbing into our blood. And the reason that's good is because if you're somebody that's already obese or something like that, you want to eat something that's high in cellulose because that means that you're eating carbs, but those carbs are not being broken down to glucose. And so that glucose can't be absorbed into your bloodstream. And so you're lowering your glucose levels. Um, so in terms of this, the question I just added for fun, but what polysaccharide cannot be digested by humans is actually cellulose. Because cellulose has beta one to four bonds and humans don't have the enzyme that breaks that down. Okay. Um, I'm going to quiz you guys now. A glucose plus a fructose makes what disaccharide? It's too gross. Yep. Galactose plus glucose makes what disaccharide? Galactose. Mm -hmm. And then a glucose plus another glucose makes what disaccharide? I know the name is kind of hard. It's cellulose polymer, but at least know that it's related to cellulose. Yeah, at least be able to identify an MCQ um, or something like that. And then if you notice the bond over here is a beta one to four bond between two glucose molecules, which I told you our body actually does not have the enzymes to break this down, which is really interesting. Okay, so now I want everyone to practice naming bonds. So I'm going to tell you that this is galactose, this one at the left over here, and this one at the right is glucose. How can I name this bond? What about trehalose? Trehalose is also made out of, of two glucose ones, but it's not a beta one to four bond, it's an alpha one to one bond. But I don't think you guys are required to know about it because it wasn't highlighted in your lecture. But you can actually, you can appreciate how cool this is because I can have two glucose molecules that are attached to each other, but just by changing if it's beta or changing what molecule it's attaching to, I can completely change what disaccharide it is. So I don't know if that answers your question about what about the trehalose, but you don't need to know a lot about it. Um, I don't think so at least. Okay, yeah, so going back to this question, this is the galactose, this is the glucose, how can I name this bond? Okay, I see one answer, does anybody else wanna answer? Mm -hmm. We look for C4, someone said. Yeah. And if you can imagine the OH used to be on this side. So does that mean that this is the cis form? I'm sorry, the, well, yeah, the cis form or the trans form? If the OH is at the top in respect. Cis, right? And does that mean it's alpha? Is it alpha or beta? Beta. Perfect. Yeah, so we got the beta part done. You know, it's a beta one. And then I see two answers and they're both correct. It's a one to four bond because that's the carbons that are being attached. So that's how you would say it. You would say a beta one to four bond. Okay, and then somebody also specified that it is linear. That is perfect because that's gonna be really important later on. Okay, so what about this one over here? So even if I didn't tell you you should be able to identify that this is the fructose 
because look at it, it's only five carbons, it's only a five carbon ring. But this one is the glucose. And so I want you guys to label it. And you can technically label it two ways. You can do it fructose to glucose, or you can do it glucose to fructose. But just give me whichever one you want. How would I label this bond over here? How do I call it? Will these bonds always be beta or can it be either beta or alpha? So I think they would have to specify. Um, but lactose, for example, I believe is almost always going to be in the beta form. So usually it's one or the other. If you change it up, then it might become another disaccharide from my understanding. So that's why we specify this. That's why we have to say beta one, two, four. Because if it was alpha one to four, then it might not be lactose anymore. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. How do I name the second structure over here? How do I name the second bond? Fructose, what to what? First tell me if it's alpha or beta and then tell me the carbons. After the hmm? fructose is beta. Fructose is beta. Perfect. Yeah, because if you can and imagine the OH used to be here. Yeah. The same time. Yeah. And it's at the second carbon. Mm -hmm. And then glucose is up is alpha at Perfect. number one. Exactly. So someone else respond beta D fructose two, yeah, two alpha, yeah, two one alpha D glucose, perfect. Somebody asked, how do the questions usually come on this part? From what I saw, um, cause I rewatched the recording for this to refresh it. I think what he would do is he might give you the actual structure and then give a couple MCQs um, in terms of like how to name the bond or whatever. So pretty much what we're practicing right now. But he did mention in the lecture, at least in the recording that I watched, which I don't think is your version, it might be last year's version. He did say he will test you on that. So that's why I'm really trying to practice this with you guys. Um, but for the last one, so a glucose and a glucose, how can I name it? First tell me, is it alpha or is it beta? And then tell me what two parts are connected. So just imagine that the OH groups are over here in case that's getting confusing. So are the glucoses alpha or are they beta? Alpha. Alpha. And then what um, carbons are attaching to each other? One. Both One. Yeah. Okay, is that clear? Do you guys want me to revise how to count the carbons, for example, or how to figure out if it's alpha or beta? Or do you guys feel like, how is the first one beta? First one, oh my gosh. How's the first one beta? First one where, like the first one up here or the first one over here? I think you're talking about the fructose, right? Or no, you're saying the trehalose? For the trehalose, they're both alphas. So alpha here and alpha here. And we said that the way that we compare the alpha is that we look at C6 and is it on the same or the opposite side of the hydroxyl? So in this case, um, the C6 is at the top and the hydroxyl is at the bottom. So because they're on opposite sides, it makes it trans and that makes this one alpha. And then for trehalose, I can see, maybe this is what's getting confusing. The C6 at the bottom is actually at the bottom in this case. The C6 is at the bottom and my hydroxyl is at the top, but they're still on opposite sides. They're still trans. So they're still both going to be alpha.
Okay, that's fine. That, that was a tricky one, so. Um, okay, so we kind of touched on this before, but I talked about non-digestible carbohydrates. Mostly what I'm talking about here is cellulose, because I talked about we don't have the enzyme to break the bond. Um, that's formed between cellulose. And so it's not getting digested. And if it's not being broken down to glucose, I'm not going to absorb it. And so there's going to be no glucose spike after I eat it, which is good for patients that are obese and that kind of stuff. At the same time, because I can't digest it and because it's not being broken down in my small intestine, my small intestine is going to think it's still full. And it's going to increase satiety. Satiety means how full you are. So both of these things do you think that these are going to, if you eat a lot of cellulose or if you eat a lot of non-digestible carbohydrates, do you think that it's going to increase your probability of becoming obese and developing type 2 diabetes? Or do you think it's going to decrease your probability of becoming obese and developing type 2 diabetes? Decrease. Decrease, right? That should make sense. Okay, um, so now we're just talking about polysaccharides. We talked about before that they're made of more than 10 monosaccharide ones, but they can go up to hundreds. Like polysaccharides can be really huge. We talked about before that the main version of glucose that's physiological in our body is the D version. And now we all know how to tell if it's D or not. Um, and I don't think I said this to you guys, but an example of a homo polysaccharide homo means the same hetero means the different so homo polysaccharide means that every single monosaccharide in this structure is the exact same like they're all glucose they're all galactose they're all fructose whatever homo polysaccharide means that all of them are the same hetero polysaccharide means that i have more than one type of monomer like i have glucose and galactose and fructose and they're all getting mixed up um, an example of a homo polysaccharide is actually one that I've been talking about for a while, cellulose. Cellulose is actually only made out of glucose. Okay, so now we're kind of moving on to the second part, which is the structures of certain kinds of starches. Okay, so I have amylose. I really, really need, need you guys to be clear that amylose is linear, okay? What bond did I tell you between two glucose molecules or to be honest, between two anything kind of is going to be linear. What kind of bond? Okay, I see one answer. Does anybody else want to answer? Okay, I see two answers. Okay, alpha one to four. An alpha one to four bond. Yeah, I think alpha one to four, I would say alpha one to four, but yeah, maybe just alpha one to four in general um, are always going to be linear, okay? On the other hand, if you form an alpha one to six bond, that is what we call a branching point, okay? And I'm going to show you what this looks like visually, but just for now, like really nail, nail it in your head, alpha one to four bonds are linear, they're gonna look like this, but if I form an alpha one to six bond, what's gonna happen is that it's going to start to kink a little bit, and we call that kink point branching points. So alpha 1 to 6 are branching and alpha 1 to 4 are linear. So amylose is completely linear. I'm going to show you on the left, next slide. And amylopectin is branched. Okay. So because amylopectin is branched, it has the presence of alpha 1 to 6, because I told you alpha 1 to 6 are branched. Um, and then glycogen. So both of these are found in plants. And then in humans, we have something called glycogen. Um, which is also branched, as you can see, because it has the presence of alpha one to six. I'm going to show you each of these on the next slide. Okay, first, I just wanted to go over amylose. This line in the middle over here that I drew, okay, this is amylose normally. And I told you that amylose is normally linear because it's only made up of alpha one to four. And alpha one to four is, it just goes straight, right? Like, let me show you back, way back, actually even here. Look at the way that the galactose is attaching to the glucose. It's just straight, right? There's no kink or anything like that. They just are horizontal to each other. This is an, this is technically beta, but I, whatever. Like if one to four bond is going to be linear. 
okay? So I have my amylose. My amylose is straight. It's purely made out of alpha one to four bonds, which are covalent bonds. And here's what's gonna happen. Let's say I have a monosaccharide right over here. I have another monosaccharide right over here. There are these things called hydrogen bonds. Now remember, hydrogen are non-covalent bonds, okay? So these are sort of weaker than covalent bonds, okay? And their hydrogen bonds are going to start to attract certain monosaccharides to each other. Okay, so a monosaccharide over here and a monosaccharide over here. Like for example, let's say this one's slightly negative, this one's slightly positive. They're going to start to attract each other and they're going to form hydrogen bonds. After they form hydrogen bonds, they're going to form a helical structure. The reason I kept emphasizing that alpha one to four is linear is that even if you see this helix, I don't want you to think, oh my gosh, it's helical. That means it can't be linear. It still is considered linear because the covalent bonds that connect all of these monosaccharides together is the alpha one to four and the alpha one to four is linear. Just because I have these weaker bonds called hydrogen bonds, they're twisting or coiling the linear structure doesn't mean my structure isn't linear anymore. Does that make sense? Because I feel like some people, when they hear coiling, they think, oh, it's coiled. It's not going to be linear anymore. I still consider this linear. I still consider this linear because it's still a straight line. It's not branching, right? I don't have any branches points like this. So it's still considered linear. It's just also coiling. And the reason it's coiling is because of the presence of hydrogen bonds. Is that clear? Amylose is linear and it's also helical. Is that clear? Yes. And the other thing you need to know is that the reason it becomes a helix shape is because of the presence of hydrogen bonds. So it's very similar to what happens with DNA, by the way. So DNA is also linear, but it forms hydrogen bonds, starts to coil, and we call those helix. Like it's the same concept. Okay, so now that that's clear, I just wanted to show you the structures. So over here, I have amylose. As you can see, it's linear. It's just one whole line. I don't have any branchings. And it's also helical. And the reason it's helical is because of the presence of hydrogen bonds, which for example, let's say this saccharide over here and this monosaccharide over here are like forming a hydrogen bond. And so they're getting attracted to each other and it's causing the helical shape. So amylose, think linear, think also helical. I have this up here, amylopectin, which I told you is branched. And I think you can very clearly see it's branched. But this point right over here is what I call a branching point. So this monosaccharide and this monosaccharide formed a alpha 1-6, alpha 1-6 bond. And an alpha 1-6 bond is kinked. It's not linear, it's a branch. So this point right over here is an alpha 1-6 bond. Like this point right over here, this point right over here, these are all alpha 1-6 bonds, okay? And those are what causes branching. Okay, I need that to be really clear. The rest of this, like for example, this segment is still going to be alpha 1-4 to because this segment right over here is still linear. But the point, the specific points of branching, those are alpha 1-6 to bonds, okay? And I only see alpha 1 to 6 bonds in branch structures such as amylose and also in other branch structures such as glycogen. But the glycogen is found in humans and amylose is found in plants. The other thing I want you to notice is I want you to compare glycogen to amylose. Okay, let me just erase everything. I want you to compare amylose to glycogen. If you notice, there's two things I want you to notice. One is that the glycogen has way more branching points. Compare the number of branching points. Like I have one branching point here, 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 here. Like there's so many more branching points as compared to amylose, right? Like I only have a couple, like one, two. So there's more branching points in glycogen as compared to amylose, but the branches in amylose are longer. Look how long this one is, and look how short this branch is. Amylopectin, right? Amylopectin. I'm so sorry. Yeah, not amylos. Amylopectin. I'm so sorry. So amylopectin up here. So I just want you to appreciate that there's more branching points in glycogen, but that the branches are shorter. Okay, um, so that's the quiz that I'm going to give you over here.
So we say that amylopectin, sorry, and glycogen are similar or identical in structure, but glycogen has more or less branching points. You guys tell me. Is it a higher degree or lower degree? More, right? More branching points. Good. Um, and then the unbranched starch is called what? What do we call the unbranched starch? The one that's linear and helical? Amylose. Yes. And what do we call the branched starch? Amylopectin. Perfect. And you can see over here, this is the amylose. It's just a linear helix. And then this amylopectin over here, um, you can really appreciate that. The one to six bond right over here that's causing the kink, right? So this is one to four. There's a bunch of one to four bonds. But this specific point, the branching point is an alpha one to six bond. But then the rest over here, like between these two is still a one to four. It's only at this branching point that we have an alpha one to six. And this would be an amylopectin. Okay, so there's a concept that I wanna compare to you. So at the right, I have my amylose. At the less left, I have my amylopectin. There are two things I want you to notice. One is the concept of surface area. Surface area means like how many exposed monosaccharides I have. So for example, if I look at amylose, I only have this exposed area and this exposed area, which means I have a low surface area. What I mean by this is that an enzyme, it can't just start at any random point. It needs an end to attach to so that I can it can digest it. And in amylose, I have low surface area or I have low um, you know, parts that the enzyme can digest it. But if I compare it to amylopectin, because it's branched, I have so many new you know, points that the amylopectin can be digested at. In other words, I have a higher surface area for amylopectin because of all the branches, okay? And so you can imagine over here, an enzyme can only attach over here and here in amylose, but in amylopectin, there's so many different points and so many different enzymes that could be working on amylopectin. That's one thing I want you to notice. The second thing I want you to appreciate is how coiled the amylose is. My amylopectin is just branched and it's free and it's open. There's nothing that would interfere an enzyme from attaching to it. But these segments over here, like these coiling, they actually prevent the enzyme from being able to attach to the amylose. So there are two, two things, okay? One is the surface area. I have more surface area in amylopectin. And at the same time, I have less coiling in amylopectin. Both of these are going to allow for amylopectin to be digested faster. Again, I just have more access to enzymes in amylopectin compared to amylose. Is that clear? Yes, it's good. Okay. okay, amylose, is it linear or branched? Linear, good. And then what kind of bonds in the amylose helix stabilize? Like what kind of bonds stabilize the helix in amylose? What did I say those were called? Um, hydrogen. Perfect. Hydrogen. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you can think of amylose, if it's going to be digested more slowly, which I explained in the previous slide, why it's being digested more slowly. Do you think that this is going to decrease? So again, imagine I'm digesting it more slowly, less glucose is being released, less glucose is entering the bloodstream. Do you think that's going to increase or decrease the probability of getting obesity and type 2 diabetes? Decrease, decrease. right? Perfect. And then this is just a source of where you could find amylose. It's something like lentils, which are generally healthier. In contrast, amylopectin, is it linear or branched? Branched. Perfect. It's branched. And I told you that it's going to be digested faster because I have like, it's not coiled and there's more surface area so it can be digested faster. Do you think this is going to increase or decrease the probability of getting type 2 diabetes? Increase. Perfect. Yeah. And then you can kind of guess what kind of foods are higher in amylopectin. It's the ones that we say to stay away from. 
um, in order to avoid obesity. Um, okay, and comparing glycogen to amylopectin. Glycogen has, is it higher in number of branches or is it lower in number of branches or branching points? Glycogen. Oh, higher. Higher, and then are the, are the branches shorter or are they longer? Shorter. Perfect. Um, what is the type of bond that creates a branching point? What do I call that kind of bond? Alpha one six. Perfect. Okay, so pretty much what they're just trying to tell you over here is that we've talked about carbohydrates. But carbohydrates can actually attach to other organic structures such as proteins, lipids, whatever. Um, the main thing that I want you that I think they want you to know is the difference between a glycoprotein and a proteoglycan. And this used to always mess me up. But the way that I would say it in my head is that a glycoprotein is a protein. And so if I would keep saying that glycoprotein is a protein, right, that would make me think, okay, if it's going to be a protein, it's obviously going to be much higher in protein than it is in carb. So glycoprotein is a protein, which means that it's much higher in protein than it is in carb. And then on the opposite side, proteoglycans are glycans, which means that they are sugars, which means that they're going to be much higher in carb than they are in protein. So you just emphasize that point over here. I have proteoglycans, which are much higher in carbs. Um, Okay, somebody asked, aren't the amylopectin easier to digest? Why do they increase obesity? So when you think easier to digest, that doesn't mean necessarily a good thing. If it's easier to digest, that means that I can break up the amylopectin into glucose in my small intestine. And if I'm breaking up, um, if I'm breaking up the amylopectin into more glucose, that glucose is going to enter my bloodstream. And so I'm going to have very high levels of glucose. And because I have very high levels of glucose, this can lead to obesity or type 2 diabetes. Does that make sense? Easier to digest equals more glucose in the blood. That's the main connection. Is that clear? Okay. Um, so yeah, that's the difference between proteoglycan. Glycan is a carb. Um, you can imagine that they're going to be hetero polysaccharides because if it's more carbs, it's more likely that you're going to have a variety of carbohydrates. Um, and it's the opposite of glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are proteins. And so it's usually the carb component is smaller, right? It's just like monosaccharides or oligosaccharides. Okay, so they also want you to know about the different types of GLUT receptors, like GLUT1 to GLUT5. I do think you kind of have to memorize them. I couldn't find a mnemonic online, but I'll tell you just how I associate them. So GLUT1, when I hear GLUT1, I think anything to do with blood. So specifically RBCs. What that means is that RBCs have GLUT1 receptors and also the blood-brain barrier, okay? So the blood-brain barrier and RBCs, which are both related to blood, have GLUT1 receptors. GLUT1 receptors literally just means what, not receptor, sorry, what transporter is there that allows for glucose to go into the bloodstream into the cell. So GLUT1 is the name of the transporter in RBCs, for example, that allows for glucose to go from the blood into the RBC. For GLUT2, I want you to think of organs that are responsible for elevating blood sugar. So for example, my liver can elevate blood sugar by breaking down the glycogen that's present inside of it, right? I can have my pancreas, we can release a hormone called glucagon, which can also elevate my blood sugar. Also, I know they didn't write it here, but kidneys. Kidneys can also elevate blood sugar because kidneys are responsible for reabsorbing glucose. So GLUT2, the way that I remember the ones that belong in there, is all the organs that are responsible for elevating blood sugar express GLUT2. Really pay attention to this one because you need to know a deficiency in GLUT2 receptors. So GLUT2 receptors are, are present in liver. Got a question on this in the TVL and it's a little bit confusing. Yeah, I could imagine that it's a little bit confusing. I don't know what question it was specifically, but if you remember it, I can try to answer it for you. But yeah, GLUT2. 
glucose uptake and its metabolism by glycolysis are enhanced by cancer cells. Increased expression of glucose transports have been reported in human malignant cells, which are the following transporters. Oh, that is a very hard question. I'll explain it when we're explaining the deficiencies. Um, I'll try to go over that question, but that is a pretty hard one, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. I will go over that just in, in another slide. Okay. And then GLUT3, just think brain. So um, the GLUT transporters that are on your neurons and that kind of stuff are specifically called GLUT3. GLUT4 is very special. GLUT4, you for sure have to remember. I'm going to go back to it, but just notice that over here, all of the organs that express GLUT4 receptors are responsible for storage of carbohydrates, specifically adipose tissue, of course, but also skeletal muscles also responsible of storing glucose in the form of glycogen, right? So GLUT4 is pay special attention to. And GLUT5, I think you just have to memorize as the one that's responsible for absorbing glucose in the luminal side of the enterocytes. Okay, the reason I really emphasized on GLUT4 is because I want you to think of its relationship with insulin. Okay, think about this for a second. The role of insulin is to store my glucose into certain um, body compartments, right? That's the role of insulin, okay? So it makes sense that the, sorry, like the role of insulin is to be, is to store glucose, right? Inside of our body. And places that we can store glucose are examples of like fat tissue or muscle cells and that kind of stuff. Glute four is the only one out of all five of these that is insulin dependent. And again, you can just think about this in, the in your head. GLUT4 is the only one that's insulin dependent because it's expressed in areas of storage, of glucose storage. And the, the role of insulin is to store glucose. So of course, all these things connect together and it should make sense that GLUT4 is insulin dependent because the role or where GLUT4 is expressed is specifically in areas of glucose storage. And the whole purpose of insulin is to store glucose. Okay, so there's only one that's insulin dependent and it's GLUT4, okay? The other way, even if you don't know that, and even if you were just blind guessing on an MCQ, just think about this. Your brain, for example, like you do not want that to be insulin dependent because your brain is so prone to hypoglycemia that even at 10 minutes of severe hypoglycemia, you would pass out, for example. So it doesn't make sense that I would want to have some sort of barrier and I would want to regulate it using insulin. No, I want my glucose from my blood to immediately be able to go to my brain if it needs to. I don't want insulin to be getting in the way. And similar for the other ones that should be able to help you understand that GLUT1, for example, is not going to be insulin dependent because I need my glucose to be transferring as fast as it can across the blood brain barrier. Similarly, it doesn't even make sense for GLUT2 to be insulin dependent because how can the pancreas which releases insulin, be insulin dependent. It doesn't really make sense. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make sense. You can't produce the insulin and then also be receiving it. Um, and then the other things is that they also want you to know about SGLT1 and SGLT2. These also absorb glucose. So these GLUT1 to GLUT5 are all passive transport of glucose. And then SGLT1 and SGLT2 are, all, are both active transport. And I think they want you to know that SGLT1 is responsible for glucose absorption. Anytime you hear absorption, immediately it's GI. And anytime you hear reabsorption, immediately kidneys. So SGLT1 is in the GI and it's an active transport of glucose and SGLT2 is in the kidneys and it's also an active transport of glucose. But all of these ones at the top are, um, are passive. Okay, so this is a slide that I added because you guys need to know about this syndrome um, that is a deficiency in GLUT2. So a deficiency of GLUT2. Remember we talked about GLUT2 is present in our liver, our pancreas. They didn't show the kidney, but it's also over there. And so I'm gonna focus on that. I'm gonna focus on, for example, the liver and the kidney or mostly the liver. Let's just focus on the liver for now. What I want you to notice is that my liver has an SGLT, right? Which I told you was an active transporter of um, glucose. And so what's happening is that glucose can enter into my liver. It can enter into my hepatocytes. 
But if I have a deficiency of GLUT2, the glucose cannot leave. So I have, I have SGLT2, which is completely intact in the syndrome, okay? And the glucose can freely move across into the hepatocytes, but the glucose can't leave because I don't have any, or I have deficient GLUT2 receptors. And so because the glucose can't leave, there's going to be an accumulation of glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose, inside of my hepatocytes. Okay, that should be straightly straightforward. It should make sense that if I don't have GLUT2, my glucose can't leave, and so I'm getting accumulation of glycogen, and it's specifically happening in organs that express the GLUT2 transport, which is like the liver, the pancreas, the kidney, mostly. I think I ignore the brain for now, to be honest. But the liver, pancreas, kidney, and a little bit of the intestine as well over here. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that make sense why a GLUT2 uh, transporter deficiency is going to lead to an accumulation of glycogen? I think that's the only concept you need to know. No, yes, I don't know. Okay, maybe not. Yet. Okay, it does, that's good. Okay, so um, so this is just saying the same thing. It's telling you the name of the syndrome, fanconi bickel syndrome. It's a GLU2 deficiency. Um, and because you don't have GLU2, the glucose can't leave the cells. And because the glucose can't leave the cells, it's gonna be accumulation of glycogen. Give me two organs, examples of two organs that express GLU2. Perfect, liver and pancreas. And then what is not being degraded, right? So if I have accumulation of glucose, I said it's going to lead to an accumulation of something. What is that? The storage form of glucose, what is that called? Glycogen. Perfect, yeah. Okay, this is the last slide. I know it's been really long. It's really straightforward. All you need to know is that um, if you have hemoglobin and you have glucose, um, the glucose can actually glycosylate the hemoglobin, and that's sort of a long-term thing. So once a hemoglobin is glycosylated, it's going to stay glycosylated. Um, and this is important because when we're measuring diabetes, I can't just measure glucose directly. And the reason for that is because if I'm hungry right now, I will have very low glucose. But it might be possible that for the past one year, I've been overeating, and that in general, I do have very high glucose levels. It's just that right now, my glucose levels are very low. And so instead what we want is we want something that's more long-term and something that is an example that is more long-term is glycosylated hemoglobin. Glycosylated hemoglobin is a very good indicator of how much glucose I've had in my body over a long period of time, not just a short period of time. So that's the main thing. It's a long-term control of blood glucose levels. Okay, because once it gets glycosylated, it pretty much stays glycosylated. It's not like blood glucose that just goes up and down. And the other thing they want you to know is that after the glycosylation occurs, there's these things called end product, advanced glycation end products. And those advanced glycation end products can lead to a lot of the complications associated with diabetes. So like kidney damage, retinal damage, cardiovascular damage. That's the main two concepts. I think that's the only thing they want you to know. That is it. <laughs> no, that was really long. Is there any questions? No, but thank you so much. That was very helpful. Somebody's asking to explain AGE again. So pretty much after my after my hemoglobin gets glycosylated, there's going to be some products that are going to be sort of formed in the byproduct of that, like like just small things. Sorry, like small metabolic products that are formed during that process. So during this process. There's going to be small byproducts that are formed, and those are called advanced glycosylation end products. And these advanced glycosylation end products can accumulate in certain organs, like kidneys, retinas, cardiovascular system, stuff like that, and they can cause damage. So this entire thing should give you an indication of why does diabetes lead to kidney damage? Why does it lead to retina damage? Because if I have high glucose for a high amount of time, I'm going to be glycosylating my hemoglobin, and because I'm glycosylating my hemoglobin, it's going to lead to the formation of these things called advanced glycosylation end products. And we don't know exactly what these are, but we do know that they can cause damage to certain organs. Does that make sense? 
Okay. Any other questions? No problem. I hope it was helpful. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Good luck on your guy, your exam, guys. I'll pray for you guys.